Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar from the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception coming to you live today at 11 o'clock here on Saturday from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. And it's awesome that you are with us. And we're going to be continuing every Saturday at 11 a.m. to giving you talks about the faith, about divine mercy. Now, um, I can promise you, for those of you who tuned in last week, this talk is going to be a lot shorter. Last week, I did a walkthrough of the Mass, and it was a mass talk that covered quite a bit, so it did go longer. Today, not as long. So we're going to talk about the need and God's mercy in confession. And I promise you, there will be some things that you've never heard, that maybe you've never understood, and we're going to answer all those questions for you and to be able to tell you how to answer those other non-Catholics who say, you're nuts. You just go right to God when you want to confess your sins. In some sense, that's true, but it's only part of the story. So let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord, we ask you to bring the Holy Spirit down upon us, to open our minds and our hearts, to be able to receive the grace you wish to bestow. We ask that you give us the guidance through the hands of our Blessed Mother Mary, Our Lady of Fatima, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, Our Lady Undoer of Knots, Our Lady of Good Success, to be able to open this mind of ours to understand you and to therefore love you even more. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, so stay with us today. I think you're going to enjoy this talk. This is a talk that Brother Mark will show the slide at the end, but it's based on my DVD series called Explaining the Faith. And Brother Mark, at the end of my talk, will show a slide. Uh, If you can't right now, you'll see the um, address of shopmercy.org and the live stream, excuse me, the um, video you on demand stream website as well. Okay. That's where these talks are going to be based on in the next series of Saturdays. I'm not doing the full talks. I'm giving you just a real abbreviated version here, um, but I think you're going to enjoy it. So as I said, stay with us. All right. What we have to understand is let's go. We as being Marian fathers of the Immaculate Conception, St. Faustina is a key for us and she should be for you as well. And let's look at what she said. Jesus, she said that Jesus told her that God's mercy primarily flows to us in three ways. Now you think about this. How much you hear all the time about the need of God's mercy, the importance of God's mercy, you needing God's mercy to get to heaven. All this talk about divine mercy, divine mercy Sunday, the year of mercy, but his mercy only comes to us in three ways. It's important that we know what those three ways are. First, she said, is scripture. And so if you were with us for the mass, we read for scripture. If you have your Bibles at home, this is the first way God's mercy flows to us. The second way is reconciliation. The sacrament of forgiveness and mercy, which Jesus said is love greater than sin. All right, now, The third way, we just celebrated it, the mass from the Eucharist, which Jesus says is love greater than death. Now, notice the words love greater than sin and love greater than death. So let's look at the image of divine mercy. Look at those rays coming from our Lord's heart. The red, the pale rays emanating from our Lord's heart. This is key here because what the two ways of mercy, communion and confession, what they do in those rays are what we see. The red ray is the precious blood, the blood and precious blood of our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity, communion. And in the pale ray, we have the cleansing waters of confession. Now, why does Jesus pick those two rays? Because Satan's only two tools are sin And what's the result of sin? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Jesus died on the cross, yes, because he loves us, yes, to open the doors to heaven. But people forget the main reason is the penalty for sin is death. 
So Satan only has two tools, sin and death. And Jesus conquered them both. He conquered death by dying and then rising. So he defeated death and he conquered sin through confession. <clears throat> Delegating that to the priest. And we're going to talk about this. So, <clears throat> so Satan's only two tools are, are wiped out. Wiped away. His tool is sin. It's wiped out by the cleansing waters of baptism and confession, as you see on the first ray of divine mercy. And Satan's other tool of death is wiped out because what is defeats death, life, and what is life to the Jews? Blood. So blood wipes out because it represents life. It wipes out death. And this is very important. All right, so confession is not a human invention. People say it is. It is not. Confession is not a human invention. What it is, is basically understanding that once we sin, all right, we must not seek pardon on our own terms, but on God's terms. And this is why he gave us confession. Now, these are his terms. All right, now on the next slide, what do we see there? We see a priest hearing a confession. Now, that might just look at you at like nothing special at first as we see this priest sitting in confession. But why? Why do we do this? All right. We take our bodily ailments to the doctor of the body. We're doing it right now in this time of virus. The coronavirus is, is spreading around the world. And we go to the doctor of the body. Nobody disputes that. Nobody questions that. Nobody argues against that. Why then, if we go to the doctor of the body for our bodily ailments, not, why would we not take our ailing spirit to the doctor of the soul? That's the priest, the doctor of the soul. You know, my mom, I want to use a quick example. My mom, when we were growing up in Michigan, um, we had a young priest uh, at, at our uh, parish, and I remember uh, my mom and some of the neighbor ladies would talk about this priest, and I remember one of the ladies in the neighborhood was like, I'm not going to that priest, and my mom was there, and I think kind of they all agreed to it, and, and they said, uh, you know, I'm not going to that priest, that priest isn't holy, and so therefore I'm not going to that priest, um, I'm not going to him, he's not holy enough, and the thing was though, um, that same, those same ladies, and my mom included, would all go to the town doctor. There was only one doctor in town. And I remember as a little kid going to this doctor, God rest his soul, and I remember as a little kid in the 1970s sitting in the doctor's office, and then they would put us into the room, and I remember this doctor walking in every time, reeking of alcohol, 300 pounds overweight and dragging a cigarette. My, how times have changed, huh? And I remember this doctor was anything but healthy. He was overweight, he drank, he smoked, but yet my mom took him, or excuse me, took me to him to get healthy. Well, wait a minute, you're taking me to this guy to get healthy? He's anything but healthy. And I remember the ladies used to say, my mom included, is used to say, it's not about what the doctor, how he is, but what he can do for you. He knows how to heal you. Even if, yeah, he's overweight or he drinks or he smokes, he knows how to heal you. Oh, okay, mom. Well, then the same could be said for the priest. No matter how broken the priest is, or no matter how much of a, you know, um, uh, unappealing guy you think he might be, he can help you in that confessional because he was given that power of the priesthood. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. It's the same with the priest. Now, I remember my mom saying, oh, well, that priest can't counsel me. Priests have never been married. They've never had a family. Well, okay, hold on. Priests come from families. All right, I have a good friend who used to say about her family, we put the fun in dysfunctional and um, we're all broken, right? And so um, we come from families, we know about family life, okay, but, but the priest's never been married. How's he gonna help me 
with marriage problems. Okay, let's go back to the doctor. You know, I was just bringing up the doctor. All right, how many of you have been cured by a doctor? I bet there are some of you out there that have been cured of cancer by a doctor. Now I ask you this question. Did you ask that doctor, you know, doctor, before I go to you, I want to know if you have ever had cancer. Because if you haven't had cancer, then I don't think you're going to know how to treat me. Has anybody ever said that? Have you went to a doctor at the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic and say, you know what, I only want the doctor to treat me for cancer that has actually had cancer? They would look at you like you're crazy. They would say, sir or ma'am, we have the best doctors in the world that have been trained and understand how to treat you for cancer. This is the same with the priest. Regardless if he's been married or not, and some priests have in prior lives, maybe they've been annulled or widowed and they become priests, but most priests obviously are not married, but it doesn't mean they can't help you. Yes, they can. This is an understanding that the priest has about how to live your marriage within the beautiful guidelines of the church. Not rules, but roadmaps to get you and your spouse to heaven. You all remember the three objectives of marriage, right? The three, okay, I'm not married, but I can tell you the three objectives of marriage. The three objectives of marriage are to be open to life, procreative, unitive, that you join with your spouse in the renewal of the covenant, covenant in the marital act, and to get your spouse to heaven. And that's what a priest can help you do. I don't have to have been married to be able to explain to you the three objectives of marriage under our Catholic faith. So go to the confessor. Well, Father, the confessor doesn't know me. He doesn't understand me. Okay. Did you do what St. Faustina did? St. Faustina, in paragraph 647 of the diary of St. Faustina, says you should pray that your confessor understands you. Now, how many of you in line, when I look out and I'm hearing confessions and I see 40, 50 people in line sometimes at my parish missions, I'm looking at the people. Now, God bless them, they're there. That's important. But they're talking they're laughing, they're joking. Sometimes they're quiet. But how many are actually praying for their confessor? How are, how are you in the confessional line? Are you actually praying that your confessor will better understand you? Are you going to pray that God give him the grace and wisdom to know how to guide you? Think about that. That's important. All right, now many people don't go to confession because they think this, oh, he could never understand me, or he's not holy enough. Um, or worse, I don't need confession. I don't have any sins. You know, um, I went to bless a house, God bless a lady, and her 24-year-old son was there. I guess I'm just guessing at the age. He was in his 20s. And he comes home, and I'm there blessing the house, and she says, oh, welcome home. I'll change his name here. Johnny, welcome home. Father Chris is here. And you can, you can go to confession. I was kind of like, well, well, you know, but hey, great. And she says, you can go to confession. And he had to be, like I said, in his mid to late 20s. And she says, yeah, Father Chris is here. He can hear your confession. He goes, why would I go to confession? And she said, well, because you haven't been since you were nine. And that was like almost 15 years ago or 20 years ago. And he said, I don't have any sins. Okay, now I don't know. But if I was a betting man, I would say that we could find some sins in anybody that hasn't been to confession in 20 years. I'm sure we could find some. So it is important that we go back to confession, right? Now, this is what a lot of people think. I've had people come into the confession and they said, Father, I've been to, I haven't been to confession in 25 years, but I really don't have any sins. Well, okay, the first sin might be pride, right? Because we are all sinners. The Bible tells us if we say we, are, we have no sin, we are liars. We all have sin. And so we need to go back. But remember, Pius XII in the 1950s said, the greatest sin of the 20th century is the loss of the sense of sin. This is very important. All right, we seem to have lost humility. 
I'm not a sinner. I'm fine. Um, God would never, ever, ever let me be lost. We can't be presumptuous. All right, now, why? Why do we think this? We think that, you know, sin has just disappeared in our world today. Sin has lost all its seriousness. Politicians, um, newspaper articles. You know, I read online articles now. They have the most vulgar language. They use the language that you would never even dream of reading in a newspaper article years ago. Um, horrible, horrible situations. And nobody seems to think there's anything wrong with it anymore. We've become desensitized. We've become completely oblivious to the fact that sin exists. Why am I talking about confession? Because sin exists. Now, what is sin? Let's, let's go through this for a minute. Um, sin is a disharmony to God's universe. When we sin, which is turning away from God, and or turning to a creature instead. When we take our focus off of God, that's the first sin. And then when we put it onto a creature, that makes the sin worse because we're replacing God with a creature. Maybe it's somebody we idolize or somebody that we lust after, whatever it might be. Now here's the thing. When we go into this culture we seem to think there's nothing wrong as long as I'm not killing anybody. You know, one guy once called Mitch Pacwa on EWTN, he says, I don't have to worry, I'm going to heaven. I'm a good person. I've never killed anybody. And Mitch Pacwa said, yeah, you're a really good person if the only person you're comparing yourself to is Hitler. You don't have to just not kill somebody to be able to realize we're in need of God's mercy. We are really in need of God's mercy. Sin is a disharmony to God's universe. And when we do that sin, we put a poison into it. It messes everything up. People think, oh, these earthquakes and hurricanes and, and, and even the virus are, 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 are no, no consequence at all of sin. Yes, it is. Now, I'm not saying God wants to punish you with the virus. No, in God's ordained will, he doesn't want the virus or the death that comes from it. But in his permissive will, he allows it. And he allows it that we see there's consequence to sin. And when we sin, it has consequences. Now let's look at this. People don't even understand when I could do a confession and stay with me because at the end of my talk, I'm gonna walk you through a confession and I'm gonna walk you through what you should do in a confession. And I'm gonna give you how I spark in people um, their memories to come forward with some of the sins that may be hidden and eating you alive that you don't even know about. You're carrying the burden on your shoulders and I'm gonna walk you through a confession of how you can remember those things, recognize them, and to get them out, get them confessed, and then they're wiped clean. They don't weigh you down anymore. Once you're forgiven, they are forgiven. All right, so... Let's talk about this. What are some of the sins? Well, people come to the confessional, I very rarely hear some of the sins that are actually grave. Okay, there are some sins that are grave and there are some that are venial. In other words, mortal sins and venial sins. Now let's talk about this. Some of the sins that people never even think of to confess but should be on a regular basis is missing mass without being sick or whatnot. Well, Father, the churches are closed. Of course. If the church is not available or mass is not offered and you're not having access to it, then of course you're not under sin. But when the church is open back up, you got to come back to the sacraments. Okay. All right. Now, what about other sins people don't think of? Do you know masturbation is a sin? People don't think that. It's a grave sin. What about um, gossip? People don't realize that gossip, just simply a laugh at the water cooler, but gossip can be a very grave sin depending upon if we mean to hurt the person or not. And so we have to recognize there's many types of sins. And the biggest one, the king's sin is pride. And so when we don't have humility, we absolutely are in, in, in need of confession. All right, why is that? Because confession teaches humility. 
We don't want to go. Who wants to spill their dirty laundry to a stranger? Or worse yet, a priest you know. First of all, don't worry. Don't think about what the priest is thinking of you. Trust me. I've only been a priest for six years, but there's no sin I haven't heard or it's been confessed. And trust me, we priests forget confessions. Um, at my ordination, I ask for the grace to completely forget confessions that I hear and let it go. This is important. All right. All right. But many times we don't have that humility, so we don't go to the confessional. Now, if you do go, have humility. Don't go around. You don't have to go to every different priest in the whole county just because you're wondering what they'll think of you. So you, you drive 30 miles one week and then 30 miles the next week. Just don't worry about that. You don't have to go around, as I said in my video, changing your voice uh, inside the confessional. God knows who you are. And so that's all that matters, right? And he's glad that you're there. All right. Now, I love this expression. I think it came from St. Francis uh, de Sales. I can't remember. But anyway, he said, there are many, many people in hell with many, many virtues. He said, there are people in hell who worked at the soup kitchen. There are people in hell who donated to their church. There are even people in hell who sat in that first pew. But he said, there's not one soul in hell with the virtue of humility. Likewise, he said, there are many souls in heaven with many, many vices. He said, there are, of course, they've been purified of them, but there are souls in heaven who have looked at pornography. There are souls in heaven that were hooked on alcohol. There are souls in heaven that maybe didn't get a chance to be fully who they were, and then, of course, they've been purified, but there's not one soul in heaven with the vice of pride. So why do we need confession? Because it's shame or salvation. Take your pick. I'll take salvation. And so this is what I have. Oh, I want to avoid shame or take salvation? Take salvation. You know, origin, sorry to be graphic, but one of the, the uh, first uh, few centuries of the church, he said, you know, don't you feel much better after you vomit? After you get all that junk out, he says, you feel better. You get much better when you get this junk out of you. And this is what confession does. All right, I want to tell a quick story. There's a slide up there. Uh, this is one of my favorite actors. His name is Kevin James. And um, Kevin James, if you don't know, is a good Catholic. And um, he's an excellent actor. He used to play in King of Queens, like one of the last shows I ever watched on television mall cop and others. But anyway, he's come back really strong to his Catholic faith. And I want to tell you an example of a story. Um, he was actually driving um, to a, I don't know, some event like the Golden Globes or something with two, I don't want to mention their names, but world famous comedians. You would know exactly who they are when, uh, you know, we're talking Saturday Night Live caliber type of, of comedians. And he was in the car, the limo with them, and they were driving literally uh, to this event on the Sunset Boulevard there in LA, the Sunset Strip. And they're laughing and they're joking in the back of the confessional. And all of a sudden, uh, Kevin James yells to the limo driver, pull the car over, pull the car over. And the other two well-known, worldwide known comedians look at him and say, what are you talking about? And he says, pull the car over. And they said, uh, why? He just, just let me, let me, let me, I'll, I'll explain. So he, they pull over in front of a church. Kevin James goes running into the church, just blindly, and comes out about 10 minutes later. And he was a little bit down, I was told by a good friend who told me the story that knows Kevin James real well, and said that he came back into the limousine, and the two famous actors looked at him and said, what the heck just happened to you? They said, you're glowing. You're absolutely glowing. And before you were down and you were out and now you're all on a light. And Kevin James looked at him and he says, you would be too if Jesus just forgave all your sins. And these two actors were enthralled 
They were absolutely mesmerized about what did you just do that made you be transformed? Confession transforms you. It takes you from outside a state of grace where God can no longer dwell in your soul, as he says to St. Faustina, to now being in your soul again. You don't think that's transformative? That's why Kevin James came back to the limo aglow because now he has found Christ back in his soul. How beautiful is this? This is a gorgeous story. So, you know, when you go, he wasn't in there that long. Now, I, that brings up another point. When you go to confession, do you have to confess all the sins that you can remember? In other words, do you have to confess that you're sitting here on the live stream with me right now and groaning, Father Chris, you're going too long. I was going to watch this show and I wanted to clean my house and I figured I'd give you a shot, but you're really taking too long here. Um, do you got to confess that complaint? Yes. No, just kidding. Just kidding. As I always say, no, we do not have to confess every venial sin. Is it a good idea or is it acceptable? Absolutely. Yes. Is it a good habit? Yes, it is. But is it required? No. Because where are venial sins forgiven? They're forgiven in the Mass, in the penitential rite of the Mass. When you come to Mass and you come and you say, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words and what I have done and what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. What are you basically doing as you are asking for forgiveness? And what does the priest say? May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Do you realize that you have just been forgiven of your venial sins? So now if you've been to confession for your mortal sins, you you are spotless, absolutely spotless when you come up this aisle to receive Christ in the Eucharist. Your bridegroom and you are the bride who comes up this aisle. You are ready to receive him spotless. Now that's assuming that you don't sin in between the penitential rite and holy communion. Now somebody might, but just ask God for that forgiveness, right? Now if it's something serious, um, you go back to confession. Now big grave sins must be confessed in the confessional. All right, this is important. You cannot not go for to confession when you have large sins, grave sins. Now, those do have to go to the sacrament, okay? Now, let's, let's, let me give you a story here. I, I've told this story before at my missions and, and on my DVD, but I'd like to repeat it here because I think it's important. Um, a while back, I had a woman come to me for confession, and she confessed sin that um, she committed 24 years ago. And um, I was like, beautiful. Uh, thank you for coming to confession. The Lord is so happy. Heaven is rejoicing that you are here. Um, God has given you very much a grace uh, to be able to um, receive this holy communion, or excuse me, this confession, um, and, and, and receive forgiveness. And I said, welcome back to confession after 24 years. And she says, no, I come every, every month, Father. And I said, oh, okay. Well, you do realize that you don't have to necessarily um, confess those same sins. Once you have committed it, if you haven't committed again, you don't have to reconfess the same sin as long as you haven't committed it. She says, no, I haven't committed it again. I said, well, God bless you, ma'am. You must have just remembered this sin. Is that a good idea? Yes, it is. If you just remembered your sins, it's a good idea to come back and confess them if it's a grave sin in confession. She says, no, I've always known I had it. So I started thinking and I said, well, ma'am, excuse me, but what then is the importance, uh, or excuse me, the reason that brought you back today? And heaven is rejoicing, thank you. And she says, well, I was just always too embarrassed to confess this sin, and you look like a pretty easy priest. And I said, I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but the bottom line is, God bless you. 
But do you know every one of her confessions for 24 years is invalid because she withheld a grave sin. Confession is not cafeteria Catholicism. You can't just say, well, I want to confess these sins, but I'm going to leave this biggie out. No, if you do that, the confession is invalid. We need to confess all grave sins we can remember. Now, this is important because if not, as I said, the confession is invalid. But now that she confessed it, all the merits that were lost for her being out of a state of grace have come back. So I tried to get her to remember any other grave sins that she hadn't confessed. All right, now, the important thing to remember here is what makes a sin, you know, remember the only way you're going to be lost, the only way a soul is lost to hell, God doesn't send anybody to hell. We choose it. And the only way that we are lost is to die in an unrepentant state of mortal sin. Now, do you know if, I said earlier, missing mass is a mortal sin? I said it was earlier. It's actually a grave sin. There's a difference between grave sin and mortal sin. Any serious sin, abortion, uh, major lying, stealing, as I said, sexual sins, um, missing mass without a reason on Sunday, these are all serious sins, but they may not be mortal. Why? For a sin to be mortal, three things must be present. First, the sin must be grave. So missing mass on Sunday is grave. This is a grave sin, but we don't know if it's mortal yet because two conditions also must be present. One, you must know it's a sin. So congratulations, everybody. You now know that missing mass on Sunday is a sin, but I got to reemphasize when the churches are closed and you don't have access to the church or to mass, it's not a sin because it's not your fault. You would go if you could. But a sin to be mortal, besides having grave nature, you must have knowledge that it's a sin and you must have free will to freely choose it. So if I'm just laying on the couch saying, ah, I don't, I feel good, but you know, I just don't want to be bothered with church today. That's free will choice. Now versus if I'm Ill, deathly ill, or I'm really contagious because I broke out. You know, I've only missed Mass one Sunday in the last 25 years. And that's back when I was in North Carolina. And I broke out head to toe in hives from a tetanus shot. I looked like the elephant man. Now, if I would have walked into church, people would have been very upset with me. So I didn't make Mass that Sunday. Is that a, is that a mortal sin? No, because I didn't have free will. It was not something that I could choose freely. Oh, I just don't want to go. It was because I shouldn't have went. That was very dangerous to other people because it was contagious. All right, so let's keep going here. Now, what is a valid confession? Well, when you have a valid confession, uh, and remember, repeat confessions are okay. Do not get discouraged if you have a situation where, gee, Father, I sound like a broken record, I, 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 I seem to be confessing the same sin over, as long as you haven't recommitted it, you don't need to confess it. But if you are keep recommitting it, keep going back, because each time you do, you get a little more grace that helps you to present yourself to God and resist that temptation a little bit more. All right, now, what makes a valid confession? Look at the slide up on your screen right now. What makes a valid confession? In order to have a valid confession, you must confess all grave sins you can remember. All right? This is very important. Now, you must have some form of contrition. Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. If you aren't wanting to be there, you're, you're being forced by your spouse to be in the confessional and you really don't have anything in your heart that says, I'm sorry, your confession's not valid. So we have to make sure that we have some contrition in our heart. And finally, do your satisfaction. Do some form of penance. Maybe um, the penance that the priest gave you. Um, maybe uh, skipping a, a favorite TV show or a dessert maybe once a week or something. That does satisfaction to repair the damage that our sins have done, right? All right, now, the next slide shows a priest sitting in the confessional with the title there, Why Should I Confess to a Priest, right? This is an age-old question, all right? 
Why? Well, okay, we're gonna go through some biblical proof of this, but before I do, we need a spiritual guide to know that some things are even sins. You may not even know certain things are sins. We need a guide to guide us. St. Faustina said that going to confession is more than just asking for and receiving forgiveness. She said it's where we come to be healed and educated. Now, we can't rely on ourselves. Like I said, if you rely on yourselves, you're like that guy who said after 25 years, I don't have any sins. Well, you know what? If you sat down with a priest, I bet you in a half an hour, we can find a boatload, okay? So if you're not going to talk to the priest, you're not even gonna know you have these sins. And so it's important. You know, St. Faustina, she relied on her confessor uh, to be able to educate her on what things were sins that she needed to confess. All right. Let's go now to three straight slides that I'm gonna show you of biblical evidence that shows the importance of confession. Now, I'm gonna put, Brother Mark's gonna put the first slide on there. How do we know that the Bible calls out confession? Let's go to the first slide. I can tell you right now that the Bible calls out confession. You can see right there, Matthew 18, 18, Matthew 16, 19, John 20, 23. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven. Whose sins you retain are retained. He's talking to the priest. He gave the priest the authority. We're going to talk about this more in a minute. Next slide. Um, that Mark, Brother Mark's going to put up. Look what it says in the Bible about reconciliation. Just take a moment to read that slide. It tells us about the importance of needing reconciliation. This is scripture. What is reconciliation? That's basically the sacrament. The sacrament of confession. That's what we call reconciliation. All right, let's go to the final slide. This is a big one. This is James chapter 5. Now we're going to put it up on the slide as I briefly kind of add some points. I want you to read James's words. He says, when we are sick, go to the priests when you need healing and they will anoint you. And with that is the forgiveness of sins. This is the priest. Now, here's the key line. You're going to leave that slide up on the screen right now. Here's the key word. Therefore, after he tells you to go to the priests, the elders, depends on the translation. It could be presbyters or elders, depending on your translation, but it basically means the priests. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another. Now, wait a minute, Father, that just means I could confess to my neighbor boy, my paper boy, when he comes over and I give him his tip. No, he was just talking about the priest prior, and now he goes into, therefore, confess your sins to one another. James tells his readers that they must go to the elders, not just anyone, in order to receive this anointing and the forgiveness of sins. This is very important. All right, so... Now, with the slides being pulled down, let us continue with this thought here. All right. Jesus also made judges to sit in his place. And whether we like it or not, this is the way he did it. All right. Just remember, God's on our side, though. The greater the sinner, the greater the right that we have to his mercy. You know, I come from a military family. Uh, my dad was in Vietnam, and who do you think has the greater right to the medic if you're a soldier? The guy who pricked his finger on a shell casing or a guy who had his whole arm uh, blown off by a shell, mortar shell? Um, of course, the one with the more danger of being of death has the bigger right to the medic. When you're a sinner, you're closer to death. You have the greater right to God's mercy. And this is what the thing is telling us in this passage that, that we have in St. Faustina, this message, the greater the sinner, the greater the right to God's mercy. And that's in the Bible. Remember, our sinfulness cannot keep us re from receiving God's mercy, only our fear and refusal to trust him. 
Uh, Pope Francis said, God never tires of forgiving. We just tire of asking for forgiveness. All right, the next slide shows a priest giving absolution. All right, as you can see, this priest giving absolution, as any of you have been and seen in the confessional, this is what's going on. It's a miracle. Now, some of you saw my video a couple days ago or you've heard my talks before, and I've always got to point this out. In the confessional, is it the priest who forgives your sins? And as I always say, yes, it is. People say, Father, how dare you say this? Well, of course the grace doesn't come from the priest. The grace comes from God, but it goes through the priest. Christ forgave sins on earth to show he had ultimate authority. He had ultimate authority to forgive sins. And when you have ultimate authority, you have the power to delegate it. You have the power to give that power. If I have ultimate authority, when I founded my business in North Carolina, I started it, I funded it, I founded the business, I had ultimate authority. But when I would leave on a business trip, I would say, Brian or Karen, while I'm gone, you're in charge. While I, Chris Alar, when, I'm, when I'm, I'm the runner of this company, I created it. But when I'm gone, you're in my name. Basically, if there's a bill to pay, you pay it. If there's somebody to hire, you hire. If there's somebody to fire, you fire. Basically, while I'm gone, you're in persona, Chris. <laughs> Basically, you're in my place. The priest is in persona, Christi, in the person of Christ. And Jesus forgave sins and he gave that power. He delegated it to the apostles. How do we know that? You just read it. Matthew 16, 19, Matthew 18, 18, John 20, 23, whose sins you forgive are forgiven and whose sins you retain are retained. This is phenomenal. What Jesus is basically doing here is saying that the heaven has to follow the priest. If the priest says you are forgiven, whether heaven wants to or not, they have to forgive you. Heaven forgives you if the priest says you're forgiven. And all the people who say, well, Father, I just go right to God. Okay, that's a start. You should do that. But you don't have that guarantee. You have no idea. But if you go to the confessional and the priest raises his right hand and he says, through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace and I absolve you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. There's no wondering, am I forgiven? There's no hope and maybe I'm forgiven. There's no, no uh, hesitation that I don't think God has forgiven me. Yes, he has. You are guaranteed forgiveness or Jesus is a liar because he promised that in the passage we just read, whose sins you forgive are forgiven and whose sins you retain are retained. And nobody's gonna claim Jesus is a liar. He had ultimate authority and he gave it to the apostles. Oh, well, but father, okay, he gave it to just the apostles, nobody else. Well, wait a minute. If you have ultimate authority, which the apostles gave, got from Jesus, they also have the ultimate authority to pass that power on to the next priest. That's why Catholic priests lay on hands to ordain the next priests when those bishops who are priests lay their hands on the next priest to ordain them that gift of the holy spirit and ultimate authority to forgive sins which doesn't come from them comes from god but goes through them is given to the priest and so this is why it's so important you know when i was ordained a priest bishop holly laid hands on me and when he was ordained a priest some bishop laid hands on him and when he was ordained a priest, some bishop laid hands on him. And when he was ordained a priest, so on and so forth. Do you know only the Catholic faith, you know, the Orthodox claim it, but they're not under Rome. Every living priest in the world today, despite how broken he is, can be traced back to one of the 12 apostles, physically, and then to Jesus Christ. So I have an unbroken, physical, touching, laying on of hands that went <clears throat> to me from Bishop Holly to the bishop that ordained him, to the bishop who ordained him, from the bishop who ordained him, from the bishop who ordained him, all the way to Jesus Christ. Nobody 
has that unbroken line called apostolic succession. It's just another reason why the Catholic faith is the one true faith. Join me next Saturday at 11 o'clock because I'm going to give a talk on why the Catholic faith is the one true faith. I'm not here to degrade any other religions, but next week I will tell you why your Catholic faith has the fullness of the truth. All right, let's finish up here. We're getting close. All right, so what Jesus is basically doing by giving this power to the authority, when you have ultimate authority, you have the power to delegate it, and Jesus gave authority to forgive and not to forgive. So the priest has to hear your confessions to determine if you are forgiven or not. If you want to be forgiven, Jesus said it's through the priests. And if the priests have that power, how can they say you're forgiven or not unless they hear your sins? If you just go right to God, that's beautiful. It's a start, but you're not doing what God commanded. It's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in John, excuse me, James 5, 16, I just read it, to, to go to the priests. And then in, in Matthew and in, in the other gospel of John or the other passage of John, it says that they have the power to forgive sins and they were passed on to the other priests. If confession is not needed, hear me now. If the sacrament of confession is not needed, Christ's grant of power to forgive would be totally insignificant. Who here wants to say that Jesus, who granted this power to his apostles, who were the first priests, and then had the authority to, to ordain the next priest, look at, we just a couple days ago celebrated Matthias. Jesus had already had already resurrected. The apostles, what did they do to replace Judas? They brought in the next priest, Matthias, and they laid hands on him and ordained him as the next priest. They had the authority to ordain priests. Does anybody here want to say Matthias didn't forgive sins? Well, then you got to argue against the Bible because it says he did. And so this is powerful. So in the confession, if it's not needed, Christ's grant of this power is insignificant. Now, as I said, the power doesn't come from the apostle. It's through the apostles. And now the priests are the apostles that have been handed down from the first 12. But Jesus said the apostles have the authority to forgive, and that's the way he set it up. But people say, oh, well, Father, though, the thing is, um, you know, it was only for them, as I said. It's not about us for today. Well, do you really think Jesus would come to earth and say, you know, I only came to earth for the people who were alive when I was on this earth? I don't think so. Jesus came to earth and says, I'm going to be here for everybody who ever lived, redeeming them. And part of that is the forgiveness of sins in confessional. Now, this is forgiveness. When that priest says you are forgiven, you are guaranteed forgiveness. Now, is every sin forgivable? Hmm. Is every sin forgivable? Well, Father, there's something in the Bible called the sin against the Holy Spirit. So not every sin is forgivable, okay? What is the only unforgivable sin? Lying, stealing, cheating, abortion, adultery, these are terrible, but they are all forgivable in the confession. If you confess it, you have some sorrow for it, you're contrite, and you do some satisfaction. Remember the conditions to be a valid confession. All right. What, though, is unforgivable? There's only one sin Jesus says is unforgivable the sin against the Holy Spirit. And what is that? It's called grieving the Holy Spirit, and it basically means final impenitence, not asking for God's mercy. Oh my gosh, Father, how do I make sure that I am not guilty of that sin? What is it again? Not asking for God's mercy. Okay, how do I make sure I'm not guilty of that? Go to confession. By the very fact that you walked into that confessional, you are asking for God's mercy. So the very fact that you close that door and you kneel down in that confessional, you cannot be guilty of the unforgivable sin because you wouldn't be there. If you are guilty, the unforgivable sin means I'm not asking for God's mercy. I don't need God's mercy. I'm fine. Don't fall into that trap. Come to confession right away. You are not guilty of the only unforgivable sin because you're there asking for mercy. Then every other sin is forgivable. Wow. 
How much more could our Lord give to us? All right? Is your sin too big for God, Father? You know, I don't go to confession. You have no idea what I've done. Oh, really? You think your sins are bigger than God's mercy? Well, you might want to read St. Faustina, who said, if you took all the sins ever committed in the history of the world and put them together, they would be just a drop compared to the ocean that is God's mercy. You ever seen a drop in the ocean? That's what Jesus says. He says, all the sins ever committed are like a drop compared to the ocean that is my mercy. But you think your sins are greater than God's mercy? That's pride. So don't fall into that trap. Well, sin, uh, Father, I don't go because God won't listen to me. He hates me. You have no idea what I've done. God can hate you or you wouldn't be in existence today. The very fact that I can prove to you God loves you is the very fact that you are watching this video live stream. Because if God didn't love you, you wouldn't exist. The very fact that you exist means God's love, God loves you. All right, now, the only unforgivable sin is putting yourself outside of God's mercy. I don't need God's mercy. I don't want God's mercy. God can't forgive me. God won't forgive me. The second you come back into the confessional, you put yourself smack dab right back into God's mercy. Even if the confession isn't perfect. All right, so let's finish up and we'll do an example confession. All right, the, remember, the greater the sinner, the greater the right to God's mercy. All right, finally, take a look at this slide. This is a painting of Jesus in the confessional. There's the penitent, and in the confessional is Jesus and the priest. This is important, all right? So Brother Mark will leave it up for a couple seconds. The Catholics, to us, we confess our sins to God and God's minister as directed. You ever hear those medicine commercials? Use only as directed, all right? Well, when it comes to your sickness, you want to talk about real sickness that you need medicine for? Your sins. Those are real, that's real sickness. Well, you want medicine? Use only as directed. Your medicine is the confessional. Use as directed. Go to the priest as you were directed, and God is in that confessional as well. Protestants deny that Christ gave the disciples the power to forgive sins. But you have to read John 20, 23. Again, whose sins you forgive are forgiven. And in that passage, Jesus breathed on them. The only other time that God breathed on man was at creation. So in the, this, after res, he resurrected and he goes to the upper room with the men, he breathes on them. This is life-giving power. He's breathing new life. Just like at the time God breathed life into the, to man at creation, he's now breathing life into man again and a new creation. Protestants, they believe that their pastors can wash away sins in baptism. Why not priests in confession? If a Protestant believes that their pastors can wipe away sins in baptism, why is it so crazy to believe that priests can't wipe away sins in confession? Again, it comes from God through the priest. Protestants believe that God uses their ministers to provide physical healing. Well, wait a minute. You ever see those guys on TV? I say rise and walk. Get up and walk. God bless them. If Protestants, if evangelicals believe that God can use their pastors to physically heal people, why couldn't he use his pastors to spiritually heal people, his priests? Yes, he can. Again, I go back to James, the side brother Mark sorrowed. He doesn't have to show it again, but the sins of the sick are forgiven in anointing, so call the priests. He says it right there, the sins of the sick are forgiven in anointing, and anointing includes confession, so call the priests. Remember, what is, here I'm wrapping up, and we're going to do an example confession. The confessional, or the conf sacrament of confession is just that, a sacrament. What makes our Catholic faith so different than any other faith? The sacraments. There are 40,000 other Christian denominations. And next week, I'm going to tell you all about it. Why should you be Catholic when there's 40,000 other choices? Join me next Saturday at 11 a.m. because we're going to tell you why. What makes the Catholic Church different. We're going to go through Scripture, the papacy, Mary, the saints, all that good stuff. But right now, I just want to say this. The sacraments... 
The sacraments are not just symbols, they do something. Sacraments are real grace. They're not symbols. Oh, Father, you know, we had communion at our, our the evangelical church. Uh, sorry, no, you didn't. Because only the Catholic Church believes in transubstantiation. The actual bread becomes the body and blood of Christ. It's not a symbol of Christ. It is Christ. And we're going to explain that next week. Remember what a sacrament is? A sacrament is an efficacious sign. Efficacious meaning it does something. An efficacious sign of God's grace instituted by Christ and entrusted to the church by which divine life is instilled in us. Holy mackerel, this is amazing. You know, what is the worst kind of death? It's not the body. The worst kind of death is the soul. So we must take care of our soul as much as we worry about the body, and that's a good thing. We must take care of our soul. So when does God really rise us from this worst kind of death? The death of the soul in the confession. He rises us from spiritual, spiritual death in every confession. You know, um, Brother Mark teases me about this, but I think it's a great analogy. We have, and I've heard the church fathers say something like this, but this is kind of my own twist on it. We have a mini physical resurrection every morning when we wake up. We basically die if we do in one sense. We go unconscious, we go to sleep. We actually are there in some form, kind of like a lifeless sense. Not entirely, you're still breathing, but you're not moving, you're not working. You're kind of in a physical way out of it. And then every morning you resurrect. You have this mini resurrection every morning. Well, every confession you have a mini spiritual resurrection. You know what? Not even mini, major. You have a major spiritual resurrection at every confession. Your soul was dead. If you were in mortal sin, Christ cannot dwell in your soul. This is the teaching of the church in the catechism and at the confessional, God is allowed back into your soul and you have now been resurrected. Christ has conquered death on the cross and now he gives you the chance to conquer the death of your soul in the confessional. He gives us a way to do that. All right, finally, last couple slides. Here is a slide that is one of my favorites of a courtroom. It's a scene of a man. Who is that man being accused? That's us, that's you and me. Who's accusing that man? That's Satan, right? This is his judgment. And this man is being accused by who? None other than Satan. This is what our faith teaches at our judgment. The, the prosecutor uh, is Satan. He's gonna try to attack and say, he, this soul belongs to me. He's a sinner. We're all sinners, but we've been redeemed. And he's gonna to try to prove why he belongs, the soul belongs to him. And then Jesus is gonna come in, like you see in the picture, as the defense attorney and defend us. But what is that Satan accusing that man of? And everybody says, sin, Father, you're half right. What is that Satan, or what is Satan accusing that man of? Unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. The, the, um, Exorcists tell us that once sins are confessed, the demons can't bring them up. Satan can't bring it up. Once your sin is confessed, Jesus says in scripture, once your sin is, is relieved, I remember it as far as, I forget it as far as the east is from the west. So your sin is forgotten once it is confessed. Don't confess it, it's free game. Satan's gonna jump all over it. You wanna be that guy in that picture? You wanna be accused at the end of your life? I don't confess your sins, and then even Satan can't bring them up. A person can't be effectively exercised, they tell us, the exorcists tell us, without having gone to confession. And so at our judgment, Satan can't accuse us of our confessed sins. So make sure you do it. All right, last couple slides. The effects of confession. I'm sorry, I can't um, have time to explain this fully right now. I'm running out of time. I want to wrap this up. But as Brother Mark leaves the slide up on the screen, you can see how it reconciles us back to the church. It reconciles us back to God. It forgives our eternal punishment due to sin, a.k.a. hell. It even removes our temporal punishment 
which are temporal punishment, AKA purgatory. I mean, look at the beautiful gifts. All right, and then final, those are the effects. The final slide, the examination of conscience. Why do I go here? Because we're gonna finish right here today with this slide. You cannot get to confession right now in many dioceses because the churches are closed. Father, what do I do? All right, look at that screen. First thing you do is pray. Look at that slide. You pray to God, and then you do an examination of conscience. All right, let's look at this second step on that, on that slide. Basically use the Ten Commandments or the seven deadly sins and you walk through. If you can't make it to confession, you can do an act of contrition, just telling God you're sorry in your heart. Well, Father, that doesn't apply. Yes, it does. Catechism 1452 says, if you cannot get to confession and you recall your sins and you detest them, and you have the intent to sin no more and the intention to go back to the sacrament of confession when that sacrament is available, no matter when that might be, even months, you are forgiven of all sins, even mortal. Don't believe me? Look up the catechism. Father Chris, how dare you say this? Catechism 1452. That is there. So now let's walk through it. All right. I want to finish right now with a walkthrough of a good confession. And I'm a little bit late. I wanted to keep this in an hour. We just hit our hour mark, but I feel I can do this in about five minutes. Let us now not be fearful of what we got to do when we come to the confession. Now, when you come into the confessional, some of you aren't sure what to do. That's okay. The pre and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And you simply begin Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And it has been, and you just give your best guess how long it is since your last confession. Don't be embarrassed. It could be a week. It could be a month, a year. I've had confessions. My record, my record confession was 60 years. I had somebody come to the confessional after 60 years. God bless you. Now, you say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been, you know, six months in my last confession. Now, the one thing you got to do is remember, the church does teach you got to go to confession at least once a year. So if you haven't been to confession in over a year, the first sin you want to confess is not having been to confession in over a year, okay? So you say, Father, bless me, for I have sinned. It's been one year since my last confession, and these are the sins to the best of my memory. Now, again, do you have to confess everything? every single sin you can remember, even the little tiny venial ones, like eating the last piece of pizza? Well, yeah, if there was a starving person who was dying of hunger and you ate it, then yes. But if it's just because there was a whole bunch of pizza and other food and you happened to take the last piece and nobody wanted it, you know, come on, it's not as serious, all right? So you recall your sins as best you can in number and in kind. So if you've committed a sin that, okay, let's say swearing, you try your best to remember how many times you've done it and what kind of swearing it was. So the numbers, like, okay, Father, I think I've done it about 10 times. Okay. And the kind, that's number. Then in kind means, did you swear at someone? Did you condemn them? Did you say something really bad to them? Or were you just in kind of in passing out of a bad habit? Um, in a conversation not directed at anybody. You see the difference there? The kind is worse in one way than it is the other. Now, let's suppose it's a sexual sin. You do not need to go into detail. Now, the priest may ask you, when you say, Father, I was impure. Okay, this gets really hard for a priest because the priest isn't, does not need details, but you should add either with yourself or with another person, okay? And was it actual just thoughts, or was it actually actions, all right? And so both sins, be it same sex, homosexual, or heterosexual, are sins. If you're not married, even heterosexual relations is a sin, and, and if it's, it's same sex, that is as well. We need to confess those. Now, does that mean God hates you, or that the Catholic Church hates you? Absolutely not. What that means is that you're coming for forgiveness. And God understands that. He's merciful. 
This is what we do is we bring into our confession, our heart. All right, let's look at this. At this point, people might say to me, well, Father, I don't really remember any sins. I'm going to walk through with you right now, and you can get on this pamphlet. I'm, uh, I'm going to explain to you at the end here how you can get a free copy of this pamphlet called How to Make a Good Confession. I don't know if Brother Mark can zoom in on me right now. I forgot to give him a picture of this. But you can go to shopmercy.org slash Saturday. Again, shopmercy.org slash Saturday, which I'm going to be doing these talks every Saturday. I'm going to start putting products up there. And you can see this pamphlet. You just grab one, put it in your cart. And when you go to check out, enter the promo code CONFESS, C-O-N-F-E-S-S, and we'll send it for free. No postage, no shipping, just totally sent to you for free, a free card, uh, a free um, pamphlet, and um, it'll walk you through how to do a good confession. Now, I'm going to borrow from this and finish today by just saying, when people say to me, Father, I have no sins, I say, well, do you mind if I walk through a few things with you? This is what a good priest should do. All right. I have very rarely ever had the first commandment confessed to me. Father, I broke the first commandment. But most all of us probably at one time or another have broken the first commandment. Well, Father, I don't worship Buddha or Allah. Okay. But do you put the television ahead of God? Do you put money ahead of God? Do you put your children ahead of God? By not making them go to church, and I hate that term, making them go, but not having them go to church because they don't feel like it, you're putting your children's feelings ahead of God. That is breaking the first commandment. Are you putting sex ahead of God? Will you stop at nothing to find the next sexual uh, high? Are you putting a power ahead of God? I will cut anybody's throat to get to the top of my corporation. I'll step on anybody and stab them in the back to get there. Maybe it's not that bad, but are you gossiping about others or hurting others' reputations so that you look good? You know, if money or sex or power is your goal, I mean, that's why we as religious take the three vow vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. We take the vows of poverty to overcome the God, small g, of the world of money. We take the vow of chastity to overcome the small g, God, of the world of sex. And we take the vow of obedience to overcome the God of the world of power. So if you're guilty of any of those, it's, o it's okay to come and confess them. It's a beautiful release, all right? Second commandment. Go through the commandments in your mind. And, and, and this pamphlet offers up many good things besides the commandments as well. But do you use the Lord's name in vain? Unfortunately, a lot of people have the habit of doing this. It's not because they intend it. It's just a habit. Please, the Israelites didn't even say the name of God it was so reverent to them. They wouldn't even say Yahweh, let alone irreverently. So we need to be very careful of that, even if it's just a habit. What about uh, keeping the Lord's Day, Sunday? Are we enslaved to football? Or, and that's part of the reason I think maybe God's allowing sports to be taken away. I'm guilty of sports. I love sports. But he's God, not these other things. So are we putting God first on Sundays? Or are we putting our recreation? People think just because I recreate, I'm doing what the commandment says. No, the commandment says you put God first. Not even your recreation. Not your work. God. That is the command of keep holy the Lord's day. All right, let's go on the fourth one. Uh, honor your mother and your father. Well, it's not just your mother and your father. Your mother and your father represent all authority. Are you obeying civil laws? One of the biggest problems I have is rolling stop signs. I hope there's no police officers watching. So, <laughs> because I, I just really have a bad habit of rolling stop signs. And so I'm breaking civil authority. And, and, and that, it's not just honor our father or mother, it's honor our authority. And so we must take care of them in their old age or, or be there present for them too. Yes, but also respect authority. All right, fifth, murder. Okay, probably not many of you watching have actually killed somebody, but have you murdered somebody's reputation? through gossip, or even detraction or calumny? Well, Father, what is that? Detraction is when you talk about somebody and say something that's true, but somebody doesn't have any business knowing. Now, if they do have a business knowing, like it's a coworker and it affects your work or whatever, yes, you need to talk about it. Or you're a parent and it's about the neighbor who is a, you know, a registered felon, you need to talk, you need to be aware of that. But 
detraction is saying something true about somebody that somebody else doesn't need to know. You don't need to call your sister in Atlanta to tell her the sins of your neighbor down the street, even though they're true. Calumny is more serious because there you are saying something that's untrue about somebody, false witness, like, so to speak. So don't do that, all right? So we can murder more than the body, we can murder somebody's reputation, all right? Sixth, um, adultery. It's not just meaning a married person has relations with another married person. That, that could mean is impure thoughts, desiring somebody else, um, videos, um, online, uh, pornography, uh, internet uh, stuff that movies, uh, reading uh, literature that is improper. These are all things. Our custody of our eyes and our minds are important for purity. All right, so that's the sixth commandment. What about the seventh commandment? You do not steal. Well, Father, I don't steal. Okay, do you ever take from your company in the hours worked? Well, I mean, I don't falsify my time card. Well, okay, but did you really work 40 hours? Okay, well, mm, you know, I surfed on the internet for a couple hours on Monday during work time. You know, it's work at home and, you know, I'm on the clock, but I was really reading the internet. You've actually stolen from your company. Now the company also can't steal from the employee and refuse to pay them. So we all want to be aware. These aren't rules. These aren't, these aren't punishments. These are guidelines to get us to heaven. All right, so that's the seventh commandment. You know, not steal. Okay, what about the eighth commandment? Eighth, ninth, and tenth. All right, eighth is not bearing false witness. Uh, I just said, you know, you don't lie about somebody. Ninth is not coveting our neighbor's goods. What God gave you, he gave you. Be happy with what he gave you. Don't desire always what somebody else has. And then, then finally, don't, or your wife, I'm sorry, the, covet your neighbor's wife, or then covet their goods. So in other words, be pleased with what God gave you. This is what's important. So go through these things. Have I done any of these things? And then finally, I always bring up in the confessional the seven deadly sins. All right, the seven deadly sins. Let's go through these because we've all really need to be aware of these. Um, the first is greed. I personally believe that all the root of the world's problems is greed. Everything that really it boils down to, be it a murder or um, um, an estranged relationship, it always seems to be about pride or greed. And so greed is very serious. So we must be pleased and happy and accept what God has given us. The next is anger. Are we struggling with anger or even impatience? You know, sometimes that's my issue. I get very impatient sometimes when I ask for something and it's not done. I get, I get sometimes impatient and then it gets to anger. So we have to watch that. It's even some places written as wrath. We don't want that, okay? Um, what about lust? That's the next one. Lust is very serious. Um, we got to keep our minds pure and our bodies pure, right? We talked about that. All right, what about sloth? Very few people confess this in the confessional. Sloth is very important. We're always out for comfort. We're not doing our jobs. We're, we're being lazy. We should be out evangelizing. We should be praying, and we're not. We're just laying on the couch. Let's not be slothful, okay? All right, very important. Pride very powerful. Do not fall into the sin of pride because that's where Satan then starts to have control over you. All right. And then envy, jealousy. Um, again, envy and jealousy are two different things. Jealousy is bad because you have, somebody has something that you want, you desire it, but it can be okay if it's something good like holiness. But envy is more serious where you actually, you want to hurt that person and take what they have that uh, I want to kill my neighbor so I can have his wife what did what did David do in the Bible uh, David um, sent Uriah out to be killed so he could have his wife Bathsheba and God said this is very serious that's envy all right so he was envy envious all right and then finally gluttony people think oh father you know I do eat some too much but you know it's not a big deal no it is because we don't want to feed the flesh the spirit needs to rule over the flesh that's the importance of fasting. Um, to break the flesh's control over the spirit, we need to break it. So when we're gluttonous, we're feeding this to flesh. Um, and it doesn't have to be just with food. It can be television. It can be um, laying around, comfort, um, lack of any physical activity, 
let's not be gluttonous of, of just comfort and, and food and self-indulgence. So I hope this all makes sense. Um, God bless you. Again, I'm sorry I did go longer than I wanted to. I thought I was going to be 15 minutes shorter than this, but we'll work on that again next week. Um, so before we sign off and I give you a final blessing, I just want to first of all say thank you for joining us. Please come to the sacrament of confession when the church is open up again. Now, Father, you've been talking about confession that I got to go to confession, but I can't. My church isn't closed or my church isn't open. It's closed. Remember, all of this is with the intent to return to the sacrament when the church is open up again. Until then, make your act of contrition just telling God that you are sorry and he will forgive you of those sins, have the intent to go back to the sacrament after the church is open. So, I thank you, you're with us. Please join us next week as we will talk about why the Catholic Church has the fullness of the truth, why we are Catholic. That is Saturday at 11 a.m. next week, right here on Divine Mercy Official or thedivinemercy.org. If you would like this on DVD, this is my brand new DVD. Brother Mark has a slide. Hopefully it gets on the screen. It's called Explaining the Faith. And I have 13 new talks. What I just talked about confession is one of those talks. Please grab the DVD. You can order this DVD to play in your DVD uh, uh, machine on shopmercy.org. It's on the front. You can get it right there. Or if you would like to stream it on your screen, you will see vimeo.com slash on demand slash explaining the faith. And if you can't remember all that, easier, just go to Shop Mercy. And when you click on the uh, DVD, it gives you the option to do it by live stream. And so you can go there and you can get this. It's cheaper to live stream it. It's only $9.95 to live stream. If you want the physical DVD because the packaging and the shipping and stuff, uh, it's $14.95. Okay. So, um, and if you can't afford it, but you would like it, please contact me at the Marion Helper Center um, at, at Marion. Uh, at marians at marian.org. So again, marians, M-A-R-I-A-N-S at marian.org. And um, if you can't afford it, just send me an email and I'll, I'll send you one. But you can also, again, get these pamphlets on how to make a good confession. What I talked about today is in this pamphlet. This is also at shopmercy.org slash Saturday. And on that website you can get this put it into your your um your your your, your box uh into your um your um, um what do you call it the mailbox uh, uh, uh in your shopping cart i'm sorry put it into your shopping cart and when you check out enter the promo code confess and it's free all right and so again please join us next week at 11 a.m. And one final announcement. We've been announcing to everyone that my new radio show on Virgin Most Powerful Radio will begin on the 21st, which is next Thursday. It's called Understanding Divine Mercy. Please join us. We're going to have a lot of great guests. I'm going to be hosting that radio show every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. It's going to go all over the country. Please call in, join. But there's one little thing. They said the first week may not be able to be live. We may have to just show you a recording. Um, so please, when you tune in next Thursday, if it's only a recording, uh, please hang with us. It's not how the show's normally going to be run. They're waiting on some equipment. And that equipment, when it comes, um, will allow us to hopefully fully start the live shows on the 28th of May. So with that, thank you, everyone, for joining us. On behalf of myself, Father Chris Alar, and all the Marians of the Immaculate Conception here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, may Almighty God bless you. And through the intercession of St. Faustina and Mary, Our Lady of Fatima, and all the saints, May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.